One of the major issues with acid-catalyzed titration is that it involves the formation of a discrete carbocation intermediate. This intermediate is prone to rearrangements, and these rearrangements, if they lead to a more stable carbocation, will be much more rapid than capture of this cation by water, which would lead to the desired alcohol product. What if we want to avoid rearrangements entirely, but still want the selectivity of hydration to be Markovnikov in nature? In other words, what if we want the hydroxyl group at the more substituted position, but the substrate we want to start with has the possibility of rearrangements if a carbocation appears here? Well, that's where oxymercuration comes in. This is a method for Markovnikov hydration, hydration with the same selectivity as acid-catalyzed hydration, that avoids rearrangements. Similar to halogenation, oxymercuration avoids the formation of a discrete carbocation intermediate through the formation of a key three-membered ring intermediate, in which the positive charge is located, in this case, on a mercury atom. The full name for this reaction is oxymercuration-demercuration, with oxymercuration referring to the first stage in which the alkene is treated with mercury to acetate and water, and demercuration referring to the second stage in which mercury is removed from the in intermediate resulting from stage one using sodium borohydride, the compound shown in step two here. Oxymercuration involves Markovnikov type hydration without rearrangements because it doesn't involve a discrete carbocation intermediate. Instead, it involves the formation of a key intermediate called a mercurinium ion. This intermediate is analogous to the halonium ion or protonated epoxide, both of which we've seen before, and it's formed through a very similar mechanism. This mercury atom is quite electrophilic, but it also bears a pair of electrons that can be donated back to the alkene. Mercury is an interesting transition metal in that it's fairly far to the right on the periodic table, and so while it can accept electrons as many metals can, it's also relatively rich in electrons, meaning it can donate a pair of electrons back to the alkene. It fits into the category of these electrophiles bearing a lone pair that we've seen previously. And just as in halogenation, as this electron flow occurs, one of the OAC groups departs as a leaving group with a pair of electrons. The backflow of electrons from mercury back to the alkene means that no discrete carbocation intermediate is actually formed under these conditions. The intermediate that's actually formed is the so-called mercurinium ion, a three-membered ring with two carbons and a mercury. In this first stage of the reaction, water is also present, and ring opening of the mercurinium ion can now occur through a nucleophilic substitution process. This is just like a protonated epoxide, and as in that case, and as in opening of halonium ions, in cohalogenation, opening occurs selectively at the more substituted carbon rather than the less substituted carbon. This is the origin of the site selectivity. Keep in mind that the deep reason for this selectivity has to do with the extent of partial positive charge on the two carbons of the mercurinium ion. Partial positive charge is much greater on the more substituted position than it is on the less substituted position. This SN2 ring opening followed by proton transfer from the oxygen that becomes positively charged produces an intermediate that contains a new hydroxyl group at the position we'd like it to be located, the Markovnikov or more substituted position, but still contains a bond between carbon and mercury. The purpose of the second stage, which involves treatment with the reagent sodium borohydride, which is best envisioned as Na+, along with the anion BH4-, is to replace that mercury group with hydrogen. The final product is the Markovnikov, or more substituted alcohol, and contains a new bond to hydrogen at the other carbon of the original starting alkene. Before finishing up, we should take a look at the stereochemistry of this reaction in a little more detail. By analogy to halogenations, we should recognize that this achiral alkene will experience approach of mercury 50% above the plane of the alkene and 50% below the plane of the alkene. This means that the mercurinium ion will form as a racemic mixture of two enantiomers, and we can represent that using a wavy bond here. Opening of the mercurinium ion in this step does occur in an anti-fashion, and we can see this again by drawing an analogy to halogenation, cohalogenation, or even opening of a protonated epoxide with water. However, However, because the starting mercurinium ion was generated as a racemic mixture, we should expect a racemic mixture of alcohol products here as well. 
To decide whether the overall addition of OH and H is sin or anti, we also need to understand whether the replacement of the mercury group with hydrogen occurs with retention or inversion of configuration. Unfortunately, this stage does not display any kind of stereospecificity. It often gives a mixture of sin and anti products. For that reason, we're not going to concern ourselves too much with the stereoselectivity of this reaction, except to say that it gives a racemic mixture of enantiomers when a chiral alkene starting materials are involved, and the product that tends to be formed is the one that's most thermodynamically stable in a steric sense, the one that minimizes steric interactions. That's not relevant to this particular example, since what we're generating on the end of this alkene is a CH3 group, but that's an important point to keep in mind in general.